There are many great films, of that there's no doubt, but there's a lack of discussion on one going about. A film exploring society, its flaws and all that. A film that is titled, The Cat in the Hat. While cheery and mirthful and quite a delight, this movie is more than first meets your sight. Of course it's shot gorgeously but doesn't get credit. Not on Letterboxd, Twitter, nor even on Reddit. It's a film most profound but treated quite scornfully. And although I may seem to argue abnormally, please allow me to tell how the cat in the hat exposes capitalism and promotes themes of anti-conformity. Where can one begin when talking about one of the most revolutionary films of the 21st century? It seems intuitive to start with the titular character himself, but interestingly, the cat in the hat doesn't appear until 17 minutes into the film. While I have plenty to say about the magnetic and mysterious cat, those 17 minutes accomplish an outstanding amount in terms of narrative setup, character introduction, and world building. The setting of the cat in the hat, the city of Anvil, seems happy and cheery on the surface, yet there are a myriad of details in the film that subtly show what kind of frightening dystopia the citizens of Anvil truly live in. In the opening moments of the film, we are outright told by the narrator that Anvil is... It's a town that's not huge, but quite big enough for buyers and sellers to sell and buy stuff. Immediately, this setting is defined by its commodities and its commerce. But let's look at the first real scene in the movie, where we see Conrad and Sally's mother, Joan, at her workplace of a real estate office. After a new employee is fired on the spot for innocently shaking the hand of his germaphobic boss, fired. we begin to take in the brilliant production design on display in this film, including how this production design tells a visual story. In stark contrast to the green walls, green desks, green chairs, and green just about everything, Joan dresses in bright pink, silently communicating to the audience that she doesn't fit in here. This is clearly a work environment that values conformity and is openly hostile to those that don't match those values, to the point that they can be abruptly fired for even the smallest of missteps. The idea of Joan clashing with the typical values of Anvil is consistently reinforced throughout the film. When Joan is called back into the office after being home for mere minutes, she reminds her children of the rules while the babysitter is there, and that is where conflict within the family erupts. Maybe if you just behave, I wouldn't have to consider military school. I wish I could trust you. I wish I had a different mom. Well, sometimes I wish the same thing. Immediately after storming out, Joan turns back towards the door to reconcile with her kids, before checking her watch and being pulled back to her job. We see that she knows that she should apologize to her children, but the threat of losing her job prevents her from doing so, and her departure to her lime green workplace in her lime green vehicle is, in hindsight, one of the most haunting moments in the film as it quickly yet clearly demonstrates capitalism's ability to emotionally separate parents from their children. Joan is an extremely vulnerable person. She's a hard-working single mother whose sleazeball boyfriend seeks to manipulate and control her, and her ability to both provide for her family and care for her family are under constant threat within this system. She has no choice but to trust the safety of her children to Mrs. Kwan, a babysitter who, presumably, is so overworked that she can't help but sleep heavily on the job, effectively leaving the children to fend for themselves. And even those children are pushed to extremes under the institution of capitalism. Conrad almost can't help but routinely break the rules he's told to abide by because he finds them so constrictive. I asked you to do one thing today, Conrad. Keep the house clean. Do you know how frustrating it is that you're always doing the exact opposite of what I say? Conversely, his sister Sally has adapted to this system by planning out and attempting to control every aspect of her life, almost to a comical degree. Today's to-do list. Number one, make to-do list. Number two, practice coloring. 
Number three, research graduate schools. Sally even asks her mother for more rules to follow while the babysitter is around. And she casually remarks that she has lost friends due to their bossiness. Jenny's not my friend anymore. Last time we made cupcakes, she wanted to be the head chef. I'm the head chef. Well, what about Denise then? She talked back to me, so I ordered her not to speak to me anymore. And you don't like bossy? I won't tolerate it. Yet as the film goes on, she realizes that this lifestyle has isolated her from other people, such as when she discovers that she wasn't invited to her friend's birthday party. Everyone I know is there. There's Jenny and Ellen. How come Denise didn't invite me to her birthday? As the cat himself so eloquently puts it, Sally is a control freak and Conrad is a rule breaker. And without the intervention of the cat in the hat, they likely would have stayed that way, but we'll return to the enigmatic cat later on. Instead, let's examine Larry Quinn, Joan's neighbor and boyfriend who, arguably, is the villain of the film. Larry's objective in The Cat in the Hat is to prove his worth to Joan and to marry her, but because he dislikes Joan's son, his objective is also to send Conrad, a 12-year-old child, to a brutal military school. It's just like summer camp, except with brutal forced marches and soul-crushing discipline. How horrible this school sounds says a lot about the world that these characters inhabit. The fact that an institution like this could exist, nevertheless be considered or encouraged, is deeply disturbing. Yet the characters are desensitized to this level of brutality and treat it with nonchalance. A little more than halfway through the film, however, we're presented with a scene in which Larry's television is repossessed, presumably due to his poor finances. And it's clear through Larry's dialogue that this is not the first item of his that has been taken in this manner. Larry may be a repugnant jerk, and he certainly is, but we also understand his mooching and using better because of this. It's out of necessity, at least to some extent, because attempting to dig yourself out of a financial hole can only dig you deeper into that hole. Even if Larry is responsible for getting himself into this monetary mess, it seems his only means of getting out of it is through using and abusing other people, which adds some depth to his character. Perhaps his most important line of dialogue occurs about a third of the way into the movie, when Larry tells Sally that, Sally, baby, angel, princess, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret, okay? Nobody likes a suck-up! What's fascinating about Larry spouting this rhetoric is that he spends the entire film sucking up to Joan, a fact that he is seemingly oblivious to. So desperate are Larry's situation and lifestyle that he has become a man who is painfully blind to his own flaws and harmful behaviors, regardless of whom those behaviors are harming. To be clear, whatever empathy and understanding the cat in the hat evokes for Larry doesn't mean that he gets off scot-free. By the end of the movie, Larry is exposed for the jerk that he is and is covered in a repulsive purple slime, which visually demonstrates that his vile morality, something he was able to conceal for most of the film, at least to Joan, is now visible to all those around him. It's a fairly tragic end to his story. And Larry ultimately serves as an all-too-apparent symbol of how capitalism preys on its least powerful members until they become predators themselves. Even a minor character like Mrs. Kwan voices resentment of the unjust system that so many suffer under. No more big government! <laughs> Rip his heart out! This demonstrates her frustrations with the country's overreaching but ineffective political body. And while it's a brief line of dialogue, it shows how pervasive capitalism can be to all members of society, including pet fish. That's right, this stunningly rendered sea creature isn't just an important character in The Cat in the Hat. He's also, in my opinion, the film's true villain. To summarize the character of the fish in a succinct manner, the fish is an enforcer of the status quo. He often stands in direct opposition to The Cat in the Hat, and he routinely urges the kids to conform to societal norms. The fish is talking! Well, sure he can talk, but is he saying anything? No, not really. No. Hey, Socks! No. Can it! This cat should not be here. He should not be about. He should not be here when your mother is out. It's fitting that the fish's worldview is so constrained, 
as he himself is literally constrained, only allowed to live inside a glass bowl or other small bodies of water, which might explain why his perspective on the world is so limited, and why he feels so threatened by the cat's more radical ideologies. Children, this cat is currently in violation of 17 of your mother's rules. Bravo, cat. I think these children are smart enough not to fall for your MTV-style flash at the expense of content and moral values. The fish is the voice in the back of your head telling you not to express yourself, telling you that it's better not to try at all for fear of being seen as weird or as an inconvenience. And if you don't take my word for it, take the word of the film's director, the four-time Academy Award-nominated production designer, Bo Welch. The fish is the voice of reason who will not embrace change. Impossible! His entire life is spent in a small bowl of water and urine. The fish is the exact opposite of the cat in the hat. The joker to his Batman. The golden face to his Michael Skarn. So let's finally talk about the cat in the hat. Obviously, the cat defies expectations and normality. He is id unleashed and he is so foreign in this world that the cat literally comes from another dimension, entirely removed from the capitalist society that the rest of the characters inhabit. His silliness, initially, comes off as irritating and problematic, but as the film goes on, we begin to see the cat's silliness for what it really is, kindness. And that kindness is only believable because the man playing the cat in the hat has such a clear love for and understanding of this character. I'd have to say that The Cat and Hat is my favorite book. You know, it's a great character you think is an anarchist at the beginning, and then you realize he's a teacher, and, and what he's teaching is balance. By the end of the movie, Conrad and Sally have trashed their house and ruined their mother's chances of keeping her job, with seemingly no solutions or recourse available. No, this was my fault. I'll take the blame. This is just as much my fault as yours. We should share the blame. Thanks, Sally. By the way, you're a pretty good brother. God could think that. Maybe we can room together at military school. It's only after they accept accountability for their actions and accept each other as siblings that the cat reveals the big twist of the story. He knew from the very beginning that Conrad and Sally would struggle and screw up and demolish their home, but he also had faith that they'd learn from their mistakes. Again, it's only after the pair have grown as people that the cat helps them to clean up their mess, making this twist and the emotional climax of the film feel incredibly earned. To understand the cat in the hat as a character is no easy task, but let's break the character down to just the essentials. The cat is an alien creature from a distant land who possesses godlike power. Yet he chooses to use that power to help others and inspire them to be the best versions of themselves. So what I'm saying here isn't just that Bo Welch directed one of the best films ever made. I'm saying that Bo Welch directed the best Superman film ever made. Really, look me in the eyes while you're watching this video and tell me these are two different characters. You can't. It's because of the cat in the hat that Joan's party for her co-workers goes well. She returns to a clean home and a pair of well-behaved children due entirely to the cat's influence. Yet tragically, the success of Joan's party at the end of the film is only deemed successful because of appearances. Despite the fact that the Walden family has grown closer together, what's recognized by Joan's boss, Mr. Humberfloob, is that their home looks presentable. So therefore, Joan has value as a person and employee regardless of her personal character or work ethic. I do know what kind of kid Conrad is. He can be irresponsible. Yes. He makes bad choices. Yes. Sometimes he makes me want to tear my hair out. Yes, yes, yes. But he's a good kid. And I believe in him. Now I'd like you to leave. While it may not be recognized by her employer or by the outside world, the Waldens have all become better people by the time the credits roll. And that's worth something. There's so much more praise I could heap onto this wonderful movie, such as Kelly Preston's, Dakota Fanning's, and Spencer Breslin's heartfelt portrayals of Joan, Sally, and Conrad respectively, which all serve to ground the film in emotional reality. There's Mike Myers' outlandish, Oscar-worthy performance, there's the mind-bending visual effects, and there's the hilarious gags and postmodern humor. 
but none of that would mean anything if the movie didn't so proudly wear its heart on its sleeve. For no matter how constrictive and depressing society can be, The Cat in the Hat, both the film and the character, make me believe that change is possible, even within a broken system and a broken family. And ultimately, that is what makes The Cat in the Hat 2003 a masterpiece. Thank you for watching. It was truly a pleasure to delve into the depths of this cinematic treasure. If you enjoyed the video, why not like and subscribe, for there are many more videos for you to imbibe. Now I've no more to say, not even a rhyme, so take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time. What's the difference between capitalism and communism? In capitalism, man exploits man, and communism is quite the opposite.